I'd like to invite our guests to take, take their seats, the one they prefer. So, Alek Tarkowski, Natalia Shilevich, Iza Rudkowska, Tim Rowe, who has just arrived from Boston, I believe. Just in minutes ago, in fact, just, seconds. Just. Yeah, Agnieszka Polkowska, Mr. Jawahar Singh, Yeah, we have a very interesting uh, bunch of experts from very different areas. Please take notice that we have art curators, we have designers, we have innovation specialists and visionaries, um, and experienced academics. And we will be talking about lifestyles. What is exactly lifestyle? And please start with this definition. How do you define a lifestyle? Alek Tarkowski, I just looked at you, so maybe you'll start. This is a very good question because uh, my mother was a sociologist, just as I am by training, and in the 80s she took part in breakthrough research in Poland uh, on lifestyles. It was really amazing work the they 80s. did and came up with definitions that are no longer relevant, Actually. I think, at all. Because back then they would say lifestyles are, is something that sociologists would define because we had no trendsetters, no marketers. But I think even that is no longer relevant. I think today more and more um, lifestyles are built by technology, by data and algorithms. This is and interesting. Come back to that in a second. Yeah. So lifestyles are built by technology. Here I, you can see um, dictionary definitions. I don't know if you agree with them. How do you think about this, Agnieszka? Because you are a lifestyle specialist. What does it mean? Uh, thank you for giving me voice. Um, I think it's still relevant, actually, but it changes very quickly because. Uh, uh, as by definition, uh, is it some kind of set of uh, set of behavior? But uh, but I think that the set of behavior is set by values and needs of of us, of humans, of consumers. It depends um, uh, so how we how we name it exactly. But it shifts uh, very quickly because of uh, because of uh, drivers of change, like economical, uh, environmental societal or technological as we're speaking here so uh, so I think it's still relevant but it changes quickly because of uh, technology mostly so we have now two thoughts that uh, life size is being accelerated by technology and but it's also con it also concerns our needs our habits our values what else would you add maybe mr. Singh well I mean <coughs> for me uh, lifestyle is the way of matter of living, all right? I still value the old definition where it's values and attitude, which means what is defined by the Greeks also where the elders were feeding the information to the youngers, the way of life and everything. And I fully agree with you, things are changing as the environment, landscape around us is changing. So definitely there's a lot of, I would say, uh, the matter which affects on it's like the media, mm -hmm. you have the, the countries, uh, the how we behave, how we live with the other people, so I think the lifestyle actually develops over the years when mm -hmm. the person mm -hmm. is growing. So it develops. It's an idea in process, right? Okay, maybe we'll move, or if, if you have something to add to this. Okay, so maybe we can move a bit further and ask whether uh, or the how do lifestyles accelerate our modes of consumption? Uh, do they reproduce or amplify social inequalities, for example? So I'll start, first of all, Thank you for having me here, everyone. Um, I'm sorry that uh, my flight came in a little bit late, but I guess almost just in time. Um, first, I, I guess I would say that uh, in the United States, we're starting to use the word lifestyle in a couple of ways frequently. Um, we, uh, you may have heard the term lifestyle business. And uh, a lifestyle business is a business where the definition is where the entrepreneur is not so interested in profits or building a huge company, but rather they're interested in living well, enjoying uh, time with their family, uh, enjoying time with friends. Has this anything to do with, with uh, benefit corporations? Um, well, the benefit corporation would be a term we use for a company that is trying to make the world better. Mm -hmm. uh, lifestyle business would be one where the entrepreneur makes a choice to come home earlier for dinner to be with their kids 
and instead of uh, staying later to win one more contract and, and make more money. And I raise it because I think the way we think about the word lifestyle now in the United States has to do with making choices that prioritize the human side of us and deprioritize some of the classical notions of what success is. So it's a kind of a, a term with a lot of connotation. Mm -hmm. um, the second way that we use the word lifestyle now in the United States refers to inclusion. Uh, we talk, it used to be uh, in the United States that we had one idea of what a family should be like, a father, a mother, kids grow up, go to school, etc. And now in the United States, we have a much more wide definition of what it's, how it's okay to be a person, including if you're gay, if you have uh, other kinds of things in your life, you don't want to have a family, lots of different variations. Uh, what we now refer to is a kind of a diverse community. So when you hear the word lifestyle in the United States, sometimes we're talking about embrace, ev encouraging people to embrace the lifestyle that they want to have for them. It's a, it's a way of accepting differences within society. Um, so I would just start by saying for us, when we think about new lifestyle, we're thinking about a kind of a reprioritization, uh, focusing on uh, being more human, Mm -hmm. And we're thinking about uh, accepting the lifestyles of different people that may not be the same as the lifestyle okay. that you want. I may promise that we can get back to this uh, in a few minutes, okay? But I'd really like to address this question to, to Natalia, because I remember uh, a few years ago, I saw on your exhibition that you created together with uh, Wukash Onduda, a very interesting piece of work made by a Chinese artist who uh, was working in a factory, Apple factory in China, 45 days just to buy an uh, uh, iPad uh, that, is wo that was worth the same as he earned through these 45 days. Can you, can, you, can you give a bigger picture for this? Sure. Um, so uh, the artist himself was trying to estimate how much labor he actually needs to perform in order to afford you know, a great token of uh, artistic lifestyle and of uh, creative class. So an Apple computer or, or um, tablet. tablet. In this case, this was a tablet. So um, in the end, he was trying to reveal um, how also, uh, you know, art practitioners, not just creative class, but let's say art practitioners, so the class or like the part of lifestyle that I'm part of, who are often associating with very left field politics are actually buying into certain streams of lifestyle that um, might seem creative, creative, user friendly, uh, that enhance our work. Um, and yet, you know, like at the end of the day, um, this is based on very difficult mm -hmm. uh, labor conditions of the others. Mm -hmm. Uh, but to go back to your question about um, lifestyle and to piggyback on what Alec was saying, um, I also perceive lifestyle as a certain software maybe, not necessarily something driven by algorithms, but an operating software, uh, not to say an ideology. Uh -huh. So it's not just about values, but it's actually, um, it's something that encapsulates your whole existence and on which different brands and oftentimes corporations and do, do you believe that, that that we that we that we choose our lifestyle so we choose our software or we are being programmed by it I think smart brands predict your software and mm -hmm. they build a lifestyle for you before you realize yeah, and example uh, and, and Apple is perfect example so for example iPod was a generation turnover right so it was a big change and you recall the story that uh, iPod was was you know iPod took, took over 60% of the market that was already well defined yeah but by other brands and if you if you recognize the, the competition for iPod that was technology so you you can see uh, for for Intel uh, it was elder a bit but then uh, Dell approached uh, and they 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 failed with this product, right? So people uh, choose iPods because they were better for their lifestyles, right? So that would be an example of how we are being programmed in a way, or you disagree, maybe Isa now. <laughs> Yeah, well, maybe maybe it's uh, good that you question me now because um, 
uh, in my work, I, I have this experience of working with people that still don't have uh, electricity or they don't have uh, TVs and computers in their houses. So um, I still uh, I see how uh, new technologies impact them as well. Uh, but uh, I see that in young people that are um, not playing anymore in backyards, but they are, for example, uh, like staying in front of uh, this um, smartphones or things like this. Uh, and I see um, how um, being together and uh, uh, make, like th thinking about lifestyle as uh, intuition uh, bring people happiness back together. Like to you know, like how uh, by by uh, integrating people and uh, skipping mm -hmm. new technologies, you can bring them together uh, together mm -hmm. again. And how happy they are without iPhones and without uh, things like this. Still, so you know, like. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so maybe Natalia and I have. S I, uh, yes, Natalia. I just wanted to mm -hmm. say that mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of this article uh, about um, different CEOs from Silicon Valley. That most of them, in their um, upbringing, not in the upbringing, but in their family life, they they choose to minimize the the screen time for the kids. So this will become momentarily a new lifestyle for mm -hmm. like the upper middle class. I mean, something that you know, will create um, probably like new types of kindergartens and, and new forms of... Um, is it really green? so, Mr. Rowe, yes. that your colleagues choose for their child's such lifestyle? In, in our community, every parent is talking about screen time and the maximum amount that's healthy. And we're also noticing uh, with Facebook and these things um, some really bad trends, uh, yeah. very quickly increasing anxiety in society, yeah, and I, so we're beginning to, beginning to understand uh, mm -hmm. the how, what we need to change. Yeah. I'm just exhibiting behind you the, the statistics that I've, uh, sorry for not having another screen, that I found uh, recently about what has changed after, you know, lifestyles became so popular, uh, after my, uh, smartphones and iPhones became so popular, how they, how they affected the not only way we live, that, but also the way the, our identities, right? So this is a small question uh, that we, I, I believe we will address promptly about how technology affects our identities. But, but, let's, let's, yes, but let's get back to this later. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's very important topic because we are speaking about, um, about technology from few minutes and it's very interesting because uh, we are forgetting about the operating system we are in and it's called capitalism mm -hmm. and capitalism is driven by technocracy and the main uh, the main strategy of technocracy uh, is uh, to the increase profits the socialization mm -hmm. So we are uh, we are moving from the from the moment where, where we had communities. We are moving to the we are moving to to the moment where we only have operating individuals, and it's causing mental diseases, and all of that we've been speaking about. And I think it's uh, it's important to to address this issue. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree, mm -hmm. and I think though that society is beginning to offer alternatives. Um, so, um, in fact, uh, we're here in Hub Hub, which is a co-working community. That's a new concept in the last decade, and it's a community. It, people are coming together and deciding, instead of being quite so isolated, um, maybe instead of working from their computer remotely or virtually, they're saying, no, I want to I be around people, I want to make connections. Uh, that's what uh, CIC, for those of you who know what CIC is, that's what we do in the United States. I, I see a huge growth in the incre increase in the interest in physical, real community, uh, playing board games and going running and those kinds of things together. Okay, so we will get back to this after summarizing our discussion, uh, when we will, uh, you know, pick up the contemporary lifestyles or lifestyles of contemporary. I just want to show you the nice, nice parole I found that offline is the new luxury, and yes. And look, you, you know, if you have, you know, the luxury, uh, only very rich person uh, in sense, not only uh, cap of capital sense, but in sense of uh, personality and strength, inner strength, has this comfort of operating offline. But I believe we can get back to this uh, uh, in, a f in a half an hour or something. 
but uh, so we 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 getting back to this to this um, question you haven't answered. I mean, do you believe that lifestyle accelerates our modes of consumption, and is it maybe maybe its main function? Yeah, and uh, maybe it's therefore reproduces social inequalities. Well, I think what is being affected. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, is we are getting affected by as a media. Mm -hmm by the products, by the companies. So definitely, you know, that uh -huh. increases the capitalism because that's the whole idea behind it. So when you say it's a new lifestyle now, I okay. mean, things change. There was a lifestyle when you had a Nokia phone. You know, you, you are, you are uh, disembarking from the aircraft, everybody switch on the telephone, and there was this special noise, you know, pee, 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 pee. Yes. It's gone now. It's not there. Yeah. yeah now but it's smartphones and everything. Nokia is getting back. I mean, well, it's not the know. same charm. I mean, yeah. it's, the, the time has passed. So I'm definitely the lifestyle effects, and mm -hmm. it, in my opinion, it does give an edge to the capitalism for sure. You know, because mm -hmm. the people tend to get new things. They are going after that because the sphere, the social area where they're li living, they see what the other people are wearing, using. Mm -hmm. So they want to go after the same thing. You know. Okay, Alex Tarkovsky. I have a bit of an issue with, with framing the question like that uh -huh. because I think lifestyles are tied to inequality, but lifestyles, I, I know I think if you work in marketing and I don't, I even avoided that topic in my sociological studies, then probably you think of lifestyle like a tool you can wield, you can, you can like shape lifestyles and you know you figure out trends and then you segment and you can like play with the lifestyle and something happens to people. I think lifestyles are inherent to people, you know, you have a lifestyle and the thing you can look at is that they're very varied and I don't want to make too big of generalizations, mm -hmm. but I think when we look at inequalities, I would say we see today there are big communities in big parts of the society in Poland where lifestyles are very sort of shared and communal. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think like, think last weekend and how many Poles did the ritual of having a grill and it's not the nice American barbecue. They buy these like aluminum tin foil thingies and you buy some cheap sausage and some kashanka and you do that and you feel it's being done. It's a ritual done by your colleagues and friends and the friendly smoke and smells waft from every garden. But the other part of the society has lifestyles that are extremely fragmented. And that's mm -hmm. what I said about technologies. And we, we all like that. We listen to varied music, uh, eat strange food, uh, you know, and sort of, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. in Poland, in a society which for so long has been so um, monotonous in many ways, but also monotonous, mm -hmm. you know, we're ethnically not very mm -hmm. um, diverse. That's mm -hmm. the biggest, I think it's a big problem, by mm -hmm. the way, mm -hmm. for us, that sort of history gave us. Um, where suddenly some of us really are happy that lifestyle is not something communal, but it's hyper personal. Sorry, Natalia? No, uh, led to individualism. Mm -hmm. I mean, it enhances individualism in the society that mm -hmm. was uh, for a very long time. Yes, I mean, the social life was, uh, was not about the, the cult of individualism. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, I agree that um, capitalization of lifestyle is linked to, to creating inequalities in the sense that it's excluding certain people from, from certain products, mm -hmm. um, especially, I guess, especially in fashion, but also when you think about commercial, commercialization of certain um, subcultures in the history mm -hmm. and how they were tied to lifestyles, early lifestyles from like dandy culture mm -hmm. in the or late punk 19th culture. Century, century, you know, yeah, punk culture, uh, mm -hmm. beat culture in, in California, you know, how it became something more open and then like capitalize on exactly the story of for example Che Guevara it's a famous example like and right now I mean yeah. our subcultures are mostly um, virtual subcultures mm -hmm. you know like online subcultures and, and subcultures led by brands so it's more about fantasizing the way we live not living the way we the way we talk about and we fantasize I don't know. I guess this is a question to sociologists uh, mm -hmm. more so. Are you but really saying? But that I life think. Is a fantasy? Yeah, it creates real experiences. Maybe it's just a change of interface. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. we are using. So, Mr. Sink told about about medias and one as one of these factors. Therefore, I address this question: uh, How lifestyles are being produced nowadays? So, what is the role of big brand and pop culture medias? Well, I mean, it's all around us. You see, mm -hmm. it's actually, you see what you see on the media, what they're showing on the TV. I mean, the b bigger thing is people 
right now tend to watch telly instead of you know reading books mm -hmm. doing something else same the kids are more into words computers and everything now how this is happening we are seeing every day the adverts on the streets all right we are listening to the radio then we are listening to the ads there then we are watching tv we want to opt that and that's our you know internal sort of thing what we want to go for so definitely the media is mm -hmm. influencing although i fully agree that everybody is having the individual lifestyle individual of course i mean it's your choice exactly. like for example in my case i am off the grid i am not on the facebook uh -huh. so somebody even looks at me you're not on the facebook yes i'm not you don't exist <laughs> 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 so it's individual do you recall how this series so dynasty what was the oh my god <laughs> yeah how it affected polish culture in the early 90s right oh it did yeah it did because i'm and here since yes, 89 so yes it did exactly. <laughs> yeah so but but we moved a bit forward i mean with technology and now uh, you have influencers right and you have mega influencers you have macro influencers and this most the most reliable the most authentic are these micro ones so those influencers who have no more than 50000 uh, followers they create lifestyles or do they not well i mean it again depends now again i'll take my example okay mm -hmm. if i'm not on the facebook i'm not on the instagram so these people who are creating that lifestyle because a lot of people who are on the social media creating a lifestyle what the people would like to live or they are actually fantasizing that so it depends mm -hmm. you know which sphere of life you are but definitely i fully agree even those people also who are there they create certain kind of a lifestyle which people would like to live okay i have i have a controversial example for you you know uh, his name was her name was asena onil you know the story of asena onil and she uh, should i no, okay. <laughs> yes <laughs> something something omits you very important oh my i mean asena onil uh, she was an instagram influencer and she still is but she came out with her traumatic experience of being very desperate and lonely because she spent she was spending all her months even days and months and weeks just you know making pictures for instagram and doing money with it yeah and then she realized that she is very depressed and very lonely and desperate and made a story out of this yeah uh, about how artificial her life was and you know this is a perfect example of about this fantasy that we create our image by by use of media by use of technology and then this image can 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 can, can depress us right yeah i think uh, personally that uh, social media is just a new way of being alone mm -hmm. it's not social at all mm -hmm. You know, social differently. Exactly. Okay. I, I'm feeling the need to, to jump in. I, I, I'm sensing a couple of threads here mm -hmm. that are not exactly the same as the kind of uh, conversations that we're having back in Boston. Mm -hmm. And maybe I can just shine some light on that. So hearing this group, I hear uh, a lot of concern with capitalism. Uh, we love it back in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Uh, and, and I'm feeling a lot of concern with technology um, and the kind of negative impacts, which are real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, I guess I want to highlight a couple of things. So on the, on the technology side, um, just as we can have non-real relationships that are entirely online, um, it mediates, as I think you were saying, Natalia, some very real personal connections. Um, so Aurelius, one of the organizers here, I don't know if he's in the room, um, not everybody knows this, but he organized a group of owners of pugs, the mm -hmm. kind of dog, you know that little dog mm -hmm. called a pug? I, I don't, don't know have what it is of in it, Polish. Okay. Pugs, yes. And um, I, I think they have like 10,000 pug owners now that have, you know, joined this group. And when, 12,000? 12,000. 12, <laughs> and um, when they have gatherings, like in parks here in Warsaw, um, you have hundreds of pugs mm -hmm. uh, and people who own pugs and have chosen this lifestyle getting together in person. And um, uh, uh one of our colleagues, uh, Kuba, um, was saying that it seems like it's an error in the matrix uh, because suddenly, like, you see pugs everywhere. It's like it's being copied accidentally by the software. Copy paste. Copy -paste. And so, it, it, so these people are having a very real personal connection around something that they care about that was enabled by that technology the same way that if you are, um, 
you know, let's, um, maybe you're a transgender, which mm -hmm. is 1% of the population, mm -hmm. and you didn't know anyone in your school and you felt isolated, but now you can get together with people who have that same, that same background. So you are not stressing positive sides yeah, How exactly. Technology and and in person. Mm -hmm. So in um, person. Mm -hmm. So in, in, it's so that the, the these crossovers are, are significant. Um, I do think we need to learn how to manage the virtual only connections, which are not terribly healthy, and move them into the real world. Mm -hmm. um, on the capitalism side, I do see what, of course, the brands are trying to sell more and so forth. But in my community, what I'm seeing is people are buying less. Mm -hmm. They're sharing things. They're using many sharing services mediated by the technology mm -hmm. not to buy. I don't, many people are not buying cars any longer. They used to be buying cars, but now they're sharing cars. Exactly. Both through Uber, yeah. but also giving their own car to other people to use. And we're seeing that with their houses. And we're seeing that now down to the point where almost any given thing you need, you can probably get in Boston for free because someone has it and they don't want it anymore. Um, or for almost no money. So let's, we should probably, and then I'll, I'll say just a little bit bigger picture. We're talking a lot about robots mm -hmm, now mm -hmm. um, in my community and how we expect the robots to probably do most of the work that mm -hmm. we do, um, which is going to create challenges for humans. But the real challenges are what do we do with our time? It's not so much that we will be slaves of an economy in a kind of capitalist sense, mm -hmm. but more that uh, we're going to be asked in a world where there's plenty um, how do we how do we navigate that as humans? So I just thought I would share. These are some of the kinds of questions that may relate ultimately to the new lifestyle that mm -hmm. that I hear talked about in you know where I come from. Mm -hmm. If I can add to that, so the example of sharing, I'm very happy to report, connects Boston with Warsaw. I live in a neighborhood in Warsaw, Stagomakotov, where there's a community group that emerged spontaneously on Facebook. Uh, had some name changes for a long time. It was called Stagomakotov Gang. It doesn't need any company running it. We're not using traditional modes of associating. We don't have an association. It's just like this group because Facebook allows it. Around 3,000 people sharing things, weird story. The most They have some issues with uh, buying things from each other, so the typical currency is avocados. <laughs> now it's changing yeah. because apparently uh, <laughs> avocado um, growing is not very good for the environment, so we might no, need to go into, I don't know, like beets or <laughs> something. But but and it, it is interesting and, and I find it interesting that you extrapolate into the future and it's good to have these conversations that maybe scenarios can be positive. I recently read the term I really like it, it's completely extravagant, especially in Poland. The the scenario you're describing, some people call it um, fully automated luxury communism. <laughs> and they do it seriously, which is weird. I wanted to use it because if we say capitalism, we can maybe also say <laughs> communism. But that's the scenario, you know, problems are solved, you have a lot of time. Uh, communist uh, utopia, uh, in a way. Uh, but last thing I want to say also, I think there's a space between these, these public influencers. It's all in the public, right? When you're in the public, uh, even if you're small scale, you know, even children learn these moves. They write posts as if they were uh, press secretaries. They make photos as if they were models. But there's a space below that. There's a, a thinker on the west coast of the US. Uh, I think he's called Venkatabaran Rao. He's a former startup guy and he came up with this term cozy web and that's the invisible web it's not the public worldwide web it's services like uh, whatsapp and telegram where a lot more people now are making a group of 10 people 100 people 10,000 people but they really have no need to show off to have publicly available photos and he's arguing and i think he's right it's a growing segment and in these groups you consciously build a different you don't want to be another eva hodakoska right at, at your tiny little scale I agree. <laughs> Basically, I agree that things are not as black as, and white, uh, you know, um, uh, why not? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, not as black, as black and white as, um, you know, this tech dystopia that was uh, very prominent in the media at least like two, three years ago. Well, of course, you know, it's not just technology, it's celebrity culture that's dri driving this narcissism on Instagram and Facebook and, and whatever. But uh, on the other hand, uh, and as much as I'm skeptical and I buy into this uh, lifestyle of uh, sharing and building my own identity on these platforms, when I speak to people, for, to activists, for instance, from marginalized groups, I mean, this is the only democratic platform, even though, yes, it's a huge corporation and there are hashtags and and uh, different indicators that can be, um, yes, measured and and 
certain products can be sold based on their choices. I mean, for many groups, this is uh, this and WhatsApp, but more so actually like the Instagram and Facebook rely on visibility. It's a space of, of visibility of marginalized groups. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, so there is still a chance uh, in believing in internet as a democratic no, space. No, I just think you can hack it. I mean, and you should hack it. Uh, and while I'm also interested in the use of robots uh, in the future of labor, um, I'm again, I'm not an economist or sociologist, but I wonder, like, okay, we'll have a lot of free time, but we'll also have a huge unemployment. We'll have a lot of angry people without jobs. So, what are we going to do with that? That's why it has to be communism. Yeah, give them so so called so mi I'm not minimal a fan of communism at all. <laughs> minimal income, right? <laughs> well, and nevertheless, we we we're still afraid of technology, and uh, you know, every, everybody know uh, knows this Black Mirror series, right? That speculates about consequences of how technology uh, is being used. In fact, not only may be used, right? Uh, when you evaluate everything and everyone and you do everything you can possibly do to boost up your public image even if it's total fake right so this was the history the story of SNA O'Neill in the real life although right so why we still are afraid that much of technologies in our life because you you said many po positive touts, you give many positive touts about technology now, right now, even Natalia thought that you can use internet to hack, you know, uh, uh, to hack capitalist culture. Yet, we are, we have great touts about, for example, you know, privacy nowadays. As you may all well know, one of trends will come by uh, soon is, is being, staying offline, right? So this, this new luxury. Because we know that our smartphones are, in fact, spying tools, right? So... No, I, I would <laughs> not say that we... I mean, I'm personally afraid of technology. I'm pro-technology. It's mm -hmm. good. But it's only the question is how we are using it. Mm -hmm. uh, how we are making use of it. What we are giving out. How much information we are giving out. How much we are secure in a sense that when somebody is asking a certain information online during the shopping and anything, how much you want to share. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think it's the people should understand that first because technology is there out to help us. Mm -hmm. I'm not against it, but the question is how we are using it. You know, sometimes the wrong use of technology can turn back against you. So that's the only thing I think people have to think. I am not on the Facebook just because of my choice. It's not that I'm afraid of it. I don't have time for it. Mm -hmm. I'm on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. That's enough for me. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I think Isa. there is uh, there is still a, a lot of people that uh, their lifestyles that are like especially in smaller communities, not in uh, big cities, where people want to use uh, uh, all this social media and everything to communicate themselves because there is like bigger communities and it's faster. I think uh, smaller communities they are just uh, uh, they they are uh, built on trust that they know all the neighbors and they know mm -hmm. everybody. And I think then if you have like uh, they are afraid of and they are very easy to um, manipulate in a way. So yeah. this is also the, like political, political stuff and things. So, you know, you were saying about this uh, fake information and mm -hmm. things like this. Uh, um, a lot of uh, people that know how Facebook, they, they were growing up with Facebook or and stuff, they, they know how it works. They, they know how to, to, um, to choose how, what is fake, what is, what is fake information, what is not. There is like a lot of um, mm -hmm. uh, of this uh, um, people getting that that got used to live in uh, uh, without it that doesn't understand uh, uh, and are easily to manipulate. Mm -hmm. Even mm -hmm. it's not about education, but about uh, yeah, lifestyle. You are telling about manipulation and how big brands or whole capitalist system is using progressive lifestyles to seduce us. I have a couple examples. Like, you know, when you, s you have a big shoe company and you want to sell more shoes to people who believe in zero waste, uh, zero waste culture, then you, you are giving them one product, right? Maybe, maybe you, Agnieszka, could tell a bit more about this strategy because for me it's, uh, it's uh, obviously cynical. 
Yeah. Of course, they want to thrive, so <laughs> yeah. I, I perfectly understand it. But uh, mm. I think it's important uh, to see it as a, an opportunity mm -hmm. because they won't stop operating like from tomorrow. So they have to change their operating system. Uh, you've shown uh, it was uh, Adidas or, or, or Nike, yeah. yeah. And uh, Nike, for example, they are moving their production back to the States, and it's very inspirational because they are mm -hmm. making people like uh, their, their neighborhoods mm -hmm. involved in the production process. Mm -hmm. So uh, for me, it's uh, it's a really information of the of the change of thinking. So uh, the system will collapse if they stop uh -huh. <laughs> operating. So uh, they uh -huh. can do it from day to day. So ha they have to change it uh, one way or another. But uh, I think uh, this is a good example because they are moving to the circular uh, economy mm -hmm. to to make uh, less uh, smaller impact, uh, bad impact uh, on, on the yeah. environment. So, of course, it it is a marketing, but I don't think that each every time is a greenwashing, mm -hmm. green as washing. we think. Greenwashing, okay. yeah. Okay, that's the term. Okay, so do you believe that lifestyles may have subversive potential? They can hack the system, the capitalist system? Yes. I ask this because, you know, I don't know if you read this article in uh, The Guardian about how neoliberalism comes us to fighting climate change with as individuals. So that the responsibility uh, is on each of us and our lifestyles, and not on the governments, not on the system, not on the big companies. And, and I think it is an interesting thought uh, in this. I mean that... Uh, even, even you know, very progressive, very uh, subversive lifestyles can be used by uh, the system, so the, by, by big companies, big capitalist companies, to seduce us, to sell us more stuff, just, right? So what to do with this? You have any thoughts? Double check. <laughs> Double check. Yeah. So be critical, be aware. Yeah, I think so, but uh, we have this opportunity to be aware. And as you've said before, not everybody has this opportunity. And if, if you are on this basic level of your needs that need to be fulfilled, you, you're not thinking about environment because you have nothing to eat tomor tomorrow. So, <laughs> so I think it's, uh, it's very progressive of us of thinking about these topics. I don't know if you girls agree. Because yeah, definitely. But I was just thinking that I guess what you're referring to, Ivo, is that uh, don't use just uh, biodegradable straws. I mean, it's not a question about using biodegradable straws and plastic cups anyway. But let's say affecting your government not to have like the biggest coal mine <laughs> in Europe. I mean, how t how can technology help us infrastructures and systems rather s just than just simply lifestyle consumer lifestyles? For me, this is like my own. Um, this is a political question a because political question. Uh, youngsters they are vo voting for for our governing party, and they have the specific, quite a specific narration, populist narration. But they do a lot of research. And but that, uh, but that uh, political choice, one could argue, was also based on the fact that they have been excluded from certain lifestyle, or maybe not mm -hmm. the youngsters, but let's say the 35 to 45 age group. The millennials. The millennials oh, I'm, I'm speaking about the group that is uh, till 29 years old, and they are very conservative, like most of them. Yes. And this is because they are threatened about this acceleration we are observing now. And, yeah, and exclusion. exclusion, exactly. Yeah. Sorry for interrupting. I have perfect examples, and but I want and two questions. I really like to ask you. Uh, so, yeah, you are telling now that lifestyle is indeed political, yeah, inherently, in a way. Uh, but has politics became lifestyleish? This is this is a question that is worth considering. But I will give an example of the trend. Yeah, you are you you gave about this tendency of lending towards uh, toward populism. I don't know if you know the brand, uh, which is, uh, yeah, this is, red is bad, yeah. 
So this is the first official um, international journey of our president, and he is wearing by accident the, the, the shirt you can buy in this store. By accident, obviously, it is. I cannot show you the marks, uh, the quotation marks. Uh, yeah, but the, the brand was built fully, uh, recognizing this niche, this 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 uh, deep um, need for. It's super interesting because yeah. we see so many brands uh, bubbling up. For example, mm -hmm. uh, I can mention Polish Catholic fashion brand. It's called uh, it's called Marizelli, and they are growing fast, and they are building a chain like LPP. Mm -hmm. actually uh -huh. Uh -huh. and they are selling so-called modest fashion mm -hmm. so uh, what's, what's the name of it uh, mo modest fashion um, so the name of the brand uh, Marizeli. Marizeli so it doesn't sound very it's Polish. a saint person uh -huh. Marizeli uh -huh. uh, um, she's saint <laughs> okay. so um, uh, so it's very interesting because uh, I think they are uh, in the same uh, in the same place, actually, mm -hmm. they are very, very, very narrow in uh, in their narration, and they are um, and they are. But they are delivering something. Delivering something that is needed, right? Exactly. Identity. Fantastic identity. about uh, self identity. This is how I recognize. Uh, I think I'll, I'll answer your question. Uh, mm -hmm. In the present times where we are living, now whether it's India from where I come, or whether it's Europe, or whether it's US. With all due respects, mm -hmm. <laughs> nationalism, mm -hmm. and I would say somehow not explained patriotism is becoming lifestyle, mm -hmm. which is which you can see in today's world where we are living around. So it also see. perpetuates consumer choices. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Alec? I would say these examples are sort of another example of, of what I was trying to explain that mm -hmm. the other part of the story is that on the sort of other side of the political spectrum, there is some, I heard, tiny company that's trying to make hardcore leftist uh, t-shirts that are sold in like hundreds or maybe mm -hmm. tens of units. Mm -hmm. And, and there, it's an issue there. I think this is, again, this thing that, that for some groups in the society, they don't want lifestyles to be mass produced. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't want to connect lifestyle with politics. And these are just two very different approaches to lifestyles. This is, um, mm -hmm. um, you know, really a phenomenon if you, if you walk on Warsaw streets and Polish streets and you see a mound of t-shirts with, uh, this is interesting for you to, in the US patriotism is something very standard, you know, you have a flag, right? Uh, Fourth of July, it's, it's not and political, I think, it's just in patriotic. Right. Uh, in Poland for a long time, uh, waving a flag was pretty nationalist and often in a sort of not the best sense, but I think this is going to change. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to change through these pop cultural moves. Just, you get a t-shirt, it, it would really be even for some old people, I think, offensive to get a t-shirt that has a, a sort of a fake, uh, uh, you know, um, armband of the uprising. Now it's, it's just a typical t-shirt. Yeah, and, and, and I think, sticker on cars. Um, and it, it's yeah. just interesting that this part of the society picked up uh, T-shirts, which are often seen as countercultural, uh, rec uh, you know, things punks use, or I don't know, skates. Uh, and now it's a way to build a, a Catholic uh, identity. Very interesting. But it's also a proof or an argument that's, that the capitalist system sucks everything in. Uh, the term for that is uh, appropriation, yeah, and yeah. So Another one, but I forgot. The, the, the I, I don't think yeah. that the owners of this brand think of themselves as capitalists and about making yeah, money. Making I think money they're very happy it. that they're yeah. spreading a certain lifestyle. Okay. Uh, and they're very smart that they're using market forces to do that because if they tried doing it as a some kind of a foundation, mm -hmm. uh, they wouldn't get there. Okay, Mr. Rowe. I, I was just not. I was just nodding to this notion. I uh -huh. think in activism, marginalized communities, mm -hmm. we're all starting to say, well, why don't we use these same tools? You know why not have brands and fashion and you know even the 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 um, what is it um, more conservative fashion movement is is the same thing. It's saying hey these are our values. Let's spread that through traditional tools. I'm not sure that that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is just how we're communicating and expressing ourselves. I I don't feel though looking around that uh, the main movements of society are driven by. Uh, by money interests. As I talk mm -hmm. to, as again, as I see young people and the things that they're interested in, 
they're interested in all kinds of crazy things. If you look at what they do online, it's as I said, it's like they play uh, fantasy um, board games and things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. That I mean, maybe somebody's making a little bit of money, mm -hmm. but not mm -hmm. not significantly. Mm -hmm. So, I think that just society is creating, uh, e ever recreating culture. That that's mm -hmm. a really healthy mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. if you think of the alternative, that we have to stick with the culture we had, you mm -hmm. know, before, that would be pretty scary. <laughs> and I, I, I do think that we are going into uncharted territory. I want to, I want to, I mentioned robots. I want to mention two other things that are not yet being discussed much, uh -huh. but which are about to change all of our experience. Um, so um, th some of you may know that world population um, is currently predicted to peak uh, yeah. in the next three decades. So we've been growing for 100,000 or mil 3 million years or whatever. What did you, well, oh, that's, <laughs> that's freaky. Um, yeah. Except, uh, right, except the current version yeah. of this has it flat here. I don't know if this, yeah, the, the Deutsche Bank mm -hmm. forecasts that are kind of, most people are saying are more, most accurate. It's flat at this point, it goes down. Uh -huh. Uh, Elon Someone Musk say about tsunami, right? About uh, the yeah, something like that. Uh, Elon Musk is starting to talk about this, um, uh, and he thinks that the population is going to crash. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason is that uh, we're actually all doing okay now. So we have enough food, we have better medical, and so forth. So we're not having many kids. Kids are expensive, mm -hmm. um, a lot of work, and yeah. uh, and so the if, if that happens, we're we're going to have. Uh, a lot more of everything, more buildings, more schools, more everything than we really need. Um, at the same time, this is happening with energy. So we've mm -hmm. been very concerned about energy and global warming, and we should have, we should be. Um, but we're approaching that point where energy is is vastly is available everywhere and is is almost free. So the technologies are are increasing or is getting better at a very steady rate. But when that compounds, we get to the point where all of your energy is basically free. And we're talking about decades, not hundreds of years for that to happen. So when energy is free and you've got more buildings than you need, you've got more land that you need and population starts to fall, we're gonna be in a very, we're no longer in the contention for resources world that has shaped all of our thinking for, for millennia. Um, and I'm just gonna put it out there and start thinking about, well, what does that really do? I think what it does is actually mean that these ideas that we're talking about like uh, you know, Karl Marx goodbye or hello Karl Marx or whichever your flavor is, um, start to actually be more important because it's because we're no longer as worried about are we going to be able to eat. Mm -hmm. We start getting caught up in these big ideas. I think it's potentially very scary. It's going to be very interesting. So can I propose a thought experiment? I sometimes do it and I wonder what your answer would be. And you know, so the world is working pretty well. It's the positive scenario. There's energy. There's, let's say, universal basic income. We're not in a state where there are like wars and drought. It's pretty good. And you have a decent life, but you're, it's not a luxurious life. And um, you don't have work, and you have a lot of free time. Yeah. And what are the three most popular things you think people do with their free time? Because I, I have my answer, I can give Develop it to you, but I want, do you want me to start? Yeah. Living I, I'm going to call on people in the audience. I can give one. <laughs> one, I think um, amateur football leagues <laughs> and football <laughs> fans, big time all the time. And second is like almost professional commenting wherever you can, you know, <laughs> take any portal and just do it because it's your lifestyle, you know, religiously do it eight hours a day. So these are my two ideas. And making selfies. Yeah. Okay, that's yours. <laughs> what, Maybe would you like to join this curious. little yeah. thought experiment? I have to think. <laughs> yeah, okay. So. Well, I mean, if I'll have time, uh, definitely I would like to read books. Read books. Which are there on my shelf, which I really touch. So, yes, for sure. <laughs> Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. But uh, still, I, I, I have to think that I have no work and uh, no, no money. Yeah, so but you have minimal money. income. Yeah. Okay. Robots are working for you. Uh, yeah, doing I your don't job. Know. I, would, I would spend my time in park, maybe. You know, no. Like, just to just to be okay. pressure. <laughs> yes, Natalia, what would you do if robot were curating uh, art exhibitions? I would be very miserable because it's my lifestyle. It's my <laughs> no, lifestyle. it's not my lifestyle, it's actually service and it's mm -hmm. the most important thing in my life yeah. apart from family and relationships. And uh, I think this is a very valid question and mm -hmm. I would like to notice that we keep uh, making these statements in plural we so, like, we speak from a very privileged position. I mean, I actually mm -hmm. don't understand mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. this utopia of uh, 
mm -hmm. uh, perfect world um, mm -hmm. is going to arrive. <laughs> but, um, and I have a comment that maybe speaks a little bit to your idea of football. Because for me, like mass sports spectacles are actually a moment of um, exhorting this accumulating energy that people don't know what to do with. So mm -hmm. I hope that football will be legal because if not, I mean, we might have like state of anarchy, chaos and, mm -hmm. and no. violence. I mean, this is also a, an alternative. Yeah, so, so maybe we should sustain lifestyles. Uh, we have until very robots, dystopian so and pessimistic can... instincts about the future. We don't know it, so we're afraid of it. No, but like, yeah. oh, like all indicators are actually mm -hmm. telling us that this planet will collapse. You I know, mean, it's not. You know, there is a book. Not, not all indicators. Yeah, you know the book entitled Factfulness. I don't know. It's uh, the, the the name of the author is Rosling. Uh, he just died. He was a Swedish doctor who became statistician. Uh, and yeah, factfulness. He gives you know hundreds of examples how, in fact, I mean, according to the statistics, the statistics gathered by um, international banks and and uh, World Economic Forum and so on, uh, how our planet is getting better and better. Yeah, yeah. that's where I was going to go. Stephen Pinker has a yeah. wonderful TED TED talk yeah. on this. Where he says, for instance, Natalia, that um, the number of people who die from disease has fallen yeah. like a hundred times. The number of people who die from war has fallen like a hundred times. He says that our newspaper has to fill up with mm -hmm. equally interesting things every year. So we take whatever bad things happen and we give them the same promotion they got the previous year. But if you look at basic statistics, that's actually getting wildly better. There are a few things that we might do mm -hmm. badly that will kill us all, um, yeah. uh, like global warming. So we have to be careful about that. Um, but, but in fact, it, it does seem to be getting better. I'll also give another statistic that's helpful. At least in the United States, um, uh, at the year 1900, a little over 200 years ago, we had something like 97% of our population was involved with agriculture. Mm -hmm. In other words, what they were doing was ra making food. Mm -hmm. And because that's what you needed to do with the technology then for us all to be able to eat. And uh, now it's like 3% are in agriculture. And actually, we're still here. It's, you know, the sky didn't fall and people are like digital marketing consultants, right? Which was not a job back then. So what happens is, you know, as the things that we do now, we don't need to get done because the robots are doing them. We're all going to do more things. And I actually think art is one of the things that we're going to do a lot more of. Exactly. Yeah. So look, when you are doing, with s smartphones, for example, they were, uh, they were intended to, to, to make our lives simpler and make more things uh, easier. But in effect, we are doing more and more and more. They accelerate our activities. Yeah? But it's natural for us that we accelerate. <laughs> so I don't think that we'll be watching football games uh, okay. all the time and uh, yeah. lying down. Maybe some of maybe us. <laughs> maybe playing virtual games in virtual reality. Maybe. maybe, maybe Still gaining money on because, it. Because, because I, mm -hmm. I don't think that we will be satisfied with uh, mm -hmm. universal basic income. Mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry for, for, for interrupting, but we are we have still about 20 minutes of discussion left and I, I think most of our guests here, I mean our, our public, is interested about your um, choices and your educations about contemporary lifestyles. I mean we're talking a bit about it during our discussion, but if you just could, you know, single out these most and, and name, you know, pinpoint the most important, most significant and most progressive lifestyles of contemporary, what would be your choice? Maybe not one, maybe two or three. You can start. I can distinguish two, mm -hmm. two lifestyles, like rural and uh, or urban, and it's uh, this polar. Uh, Polarization ah, is and uh, okay. exactly. It's mm -hmm. very visible right now. Mm -hmm. That's um, I think this in is in the city in metropolis. Uh, we are trading our freedom and our data mm -hmm. for for being in the city and uh, to explore it to have all these economical opportunities. In uh, in rural space, <laughs> we have this freedom, but we don't have this economical. Uh, Possibilities, and I think uh, that more and more often we have to make make a choice. So you tell now, you are telling right now about two general lifestyles of contemporary, and you separate uh, this yes. between because urban. Of course, here in Poland it's not uh, so visible, but we yeah. if we here in if the city. we 
Exactly. But, we, if but you we, drive if to we are country. talking about Tokyo or, mm -hmm. or New York, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> the distinguish is, 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 is quite big. That's interesting. Yeah. I would say because technology is you know, gearing up very fast, it's more like we are living very much automated life mm -hmm. and digital. You know, so that's, that's a new lifestyle I see right now, mm -hmm. which is very contemporary. I mean, if I take that, of course, I agree with you, in the villages, it can be a little less. But back again, giving the example of India, where actually in the villages, they never used to have any telephone and electricity. Mm -hmm. But right now, they're having the access to the mobile telephone. Yeah, on, in Africa. Yeah. So you see, I mean, biggest that's mobile market. That's connected, that's more yeah. digital. So connectivity, contemporary. So you asked what are the most progressive, I asked, kind of yes, edgy if you, if you lifestyles. Had any, yeah, and and edgy. Um, something I see in my kids, and my son Sam is here, mm -hmm. if you want to wave Sam. Mm -hmm. um, something I see in my kids, and Sam's the oldest of three, um, is a, um, a radical lessening of interest in material goods. So immaterial. Material goods. So, mm -hmm. um, so kids Sam's age in the teenager years when mm -hmm. I was growing up wanted a car as soon as they could get it. Sam didn't want a car and still doesn't know how to drive, <laughs> right? Um, they, they don't, when I say, can I get you the Apple Watch, then you'll be able to see my messages when I send, they're like, no, I don't want an Apple Watch. And so all of these things, so I'm seeing in this generation of the teens, if you will, a radical mm -hmm. disinterest in material goods. Mm -hmm. And I think that's pretty interesting and mm -hmm. pretty anti-capitalist. Anti it's super interesting because uh, because we are we are doing a lot of research uh, within uh, Generation Z, mm -hmm. and it's uh, I think it's interesting because it's the first generation that is actually living uh, living the consequences of capitalism. Mm -hmm. So uh, they have different needs and and thoughts about it and what is more important it, it is really a first generation that not wa was only told to work together but they were really educated and i'm a, a old millennial and i was mm -hmm. told to uh, to work together uh, but i don't know how to do it <laughs> actually and generation z is actually uh, taught to uh, to work with people so i think there are really uh, a real game changers here so mm -hmm. Kudos for your son. <laughs> Kudos. So for, for me, a progressive lifestyle um, involves doing hands-on things, uh, especially with technology. I think this is, again, if we talk about like positive and negative approaches, a very empowering thing to do is just get in contact with technology as its maker and creator. And it's doable pretty easily. You know, Arduino, Raspberry Pi, Microbit, you can name it. Um, I, I try to, this is a big personal challenge for me. I have two young daughters. They're not really interested in technology. I still try, and, and for me, it's hard to find time to do that, but I think simple things you do. But it's not only about technology. I think um, making your own food instead of eating it uh, you know, in bars every day because you don't have time to cook. If you want to get really uh, you know, more into it, have a bit of a garden maybe, and maybe a communal one, things like that. I think it, it also gives a very good, um, it has to do with mindfulness, with peace of mind, with mm -hmm. a lot of things like that. And it, but, but I also wanted to say, I w don't want you to think this is immediately going into offline. The technology is there. Uh -huh. And speaking about generations, I found out there's like this micro generation they call Xenials, which is really silly, but some marketer needed a term. <laughs> it's apparently between millennials and generation X, and I fit in it. And it's only six years, so it's very hard to be in it, so we can feel very special. And its single defining factor is that you were at the moment where as a young adult, you, had a wor you knew the world without the internet, and you were at the start of the world with the internet. It's a very good place to be because I think we are the ones, if I'm to brag a bit, who can think in terms of a balance. It doesn't have to be like all in or all out, but maybe we are the ones, mm -hmm. <laughs> the special ones who get the balance. So progressive, li so progressive lifestyle. So we, 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 we mentioned Gen Z, we mentioned millennials. I don't know if every, everyone uh, know, know the terms. Uh, just just to pick up some infographics because I uh, where, where are the millennials oh, here are millennials so we are most of us are representatives of so-called millennials in fact I heard an interesting question a uh, question posed by uh, by a recognized uh, trend analyst uh, Zuza Skalska uh, <laughs> who expressively stated that there are no millennials in Poland 
okay, so this is an interesting question, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because what, what makes peculiar this, uh, this, this millennials, I mean, what makes uh, all these social groups peculiar is their needs, their habits, their expectations, their lifestyle meant behaviorally, right? And I thought that this is interesting thought. I mean, that there are no millennials, or at least this is not a massive uh, movement because we have rural areas and we have big cities. We have rich people, rich young people who are born in the 80s, right? And went to, 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 to private schools and had, have parents who are, mm, enabled them to see the world. But this is not a common experience in Poland. How do you think about this idea that there are no, uh, no millennials in Poland? How do you find this idea interesting? Or I think they are different in each every country because of mm -hmm. uh, history. So mm -hmm. here we are, yeah. <laughs> and I am a millennial, and I'm I'm totally blending in mm -hmm. with all all the set of values of millennials. Uh, but of course, they are different. There are different millennials in China. Mm -hmm. There are different mm -hmm. millennials in USA. I think the the biggest d distinguish is the the amount of money uh, we have. Uh, because in no. Poland we are still building, we still have some kind of traditional families. We are not divorcing so much. Like <laughs> I don't know, people, uh, people, uh, for example, families in USA. Mm -hmm. So then we still still have this money of family, and in USA the situation is totally different because uh, people are gaining less and less money. So millennials are is the first generation that is actually poorer mm -hmm. than ever generation before yeah. and uh, here I think it's 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 quite blending in but there are so many set there is a set of, of values that mm -hmm. uh, that we mm -hmm. that we embrace okay. here okay. <laughs> in Poland so, so since we if I can say for millennials 15 minutes until announcements I just will uh, help you with uh, certain um, center indications that I found in many uh, different reports about um, about contemporary lifestyles. First of all, when you ask about contemporary progressive ones, uh, there comes this circular economy and zero waste lifestyle. So, yeah, uh, everybody recognizes it. I mean uh, that we are um, we are entitled and maybe even. Uh, uh, in, we are pressed to, 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 to be more aware about our consumer choices. So we do not perform linear economy anymore. We have to reuse, upcycle, right? Um, and, and rethink our consumer habits. Uh, cut plastic out. Uh, yeah, there are even malls in Sweden, or a uh, first one at least, which is totally orientated towards um, circular, circular economical products. So everything we, we, what we can buy there is, uh, is, um, is zero waste, right? Starting from, from food and until the, the clouds, up to the clouds. Then cooperativity or cooperativeness, I think, or it is at, at least uh, recognized that this is one of the trends. We are we are cooperating and doing these cooperatives, food cooperatives. We are cooperating in our offices, so like Hub Hub or CIC, this is community. And it's going to be bigger and bigger, this trend. Uh, also, you are telling about this split between cities and, and rural areas. But there is something like um, urban gardening and uh, permaculture and urban farming that is also very growing as a movement, or as a trend. Uh, then it comes to, to, to foods and uh, smart foods and, you know, foods that are dealing with expectations of contemporaries. So you don't have to go to restaurant. You can have a fast, um, uh, nourishing and, uh, and uh, uh, meal in your, in your packet uh, so that it's quick, that is, that is relatively cheap. You have you don't have to be you don't have to resign from burgers and you have um, artificial burgers which taste the same right or, or even better I haven't ate one yet 
Yeah, then new mobility, new kinds of mobility, right? Not only a physical mobility, but also online mobility. We are using more and more computer cloud, cloud platforms. We are using more products as service. So we don't have, this is what Tim Rowe told before about how to live in Boston. Yeah? You don't have to buy a car, you don't have to buy a bike. You can, you can um, rent it. Uh, and yeah, then we have uh, cheap flights or you know, affordable tourism. Frontiers are open. Um, we, more and more of us are working in mobile jobs. Right, and this is getting bigger and bigger. We live still longer, and the modes of living, although you be, so, so the idea of being elder, also has changed, right? And it's changing due to the technology, to to to, to biotechnologies, to the healthcare system. We expect to live over 100 years with new veins, with new liver, right, enhanced by technologies. Uh, but we also keep our ma our bodies fit, and therefore we engage in new relationships, right? Um, like and new type of families. We will be talking here uh, in a couple of months about new modes of relationships in society. The idea of family and you know single relationship for whole life when you live 120 years. So there would be, you know, at least 100 years with one person. Who could, who could bear this? I mean, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so we're already witnessing it, right? Uh, empowerment of women and uh, other, um, other uh, political minorities. Um, it's also kind of as, as, another, um, as another trend in lifestyles nowadays. And then we are approaching the, the, this new models of identity and of self-development. Self being empathetic, being mindful about others, about those minorities. So um, being responsible, so like fair trade, right? And being aware of how, many, how much data and controlling your data, how much data you give to big companies and trying to switch off to, 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 to be as offline as it's possible. So these are trends in lifestyles I found in, in, uh, in many different reports. I don't know if you have any comments on that because this is just a uh, you know, brief summary of what, what, we were be talking, what we were talking before, right? You know, what you mentioned about uh, earlier back, you know, about the values and the stuff, which is a new lifestyle, you know, empathy uh, towards the other person, uh, minorities, understanding the other person. I think that's a basic mm -hmm. values of life. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, it's something like with the trends, with the new, you know, uh, a want for the new things mm -hmm. to go further, we forgot that. Mm -hmm. And now we are coming back to it. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's always like basic what you should have. A person should have in her or himself. Mm -hmm. So, yes, Isa. Yeah, and actually, you can see that and when you were uh, showing the trends and you were uh, speaking about these uh, different groups, uh, I think very strong uh, uh, now is like uh, the concentration of the group of uh, 50 plus. The yeah. silver, so called silver generation, yeah. yeah. And I think uh, what you said, like, it's kind of uh, now, in my opinion, now it's like mixing like this uh, young people that they have this uh, feeling of they want to be together with uh, themselves, they want to live in communities, they go back to this uh, needs and uh, uh, things that are really important. They also uh, somehow it's like I see the connection between this and uh, older people and the uh, interesting projects that I see that uh, there is like um, empathy designing for all uh, elderly people and this ideas of creating costumes that uh, young people can fit in and mm -hmm. feel how to they do the body storming how yeah, to be elder how person how to be mm -hmm. adult person on mm -hmm. this kind of stuff so I in this connection and tr trying to find this. Uh, 
um, common uh, things between between mm -hmm. people. I th I think this is the power. In a way. So have you have you anything to add? Okay. So one more question. Uh, yeah, for the for the last five minutes of our conversation. Uh, how do you believe, what, how do you think, what factors will change the way we live during the upcoming decade, so in the next years? What factors are crucial? What factors will affect us at most, at the most? Yeah. No doubt that it will be technology. Mm -hmm. But I think that we are al already a cyborgs. <laughs> The telephone is, uh, the smartphone is our extension or wearables. today. Wearables are our ex extension. We can calculate things within seconds. We can search for things within within nanoseconds even. Mm -hmm. And I think what will change, uh, it will be the interface mm -hmm. of the technology. It will blend in <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, with us. And I think it will it will just accelerate. I mean, we see this acceleration but it's going to be very fast. And I think some of people will, will see in the situation the, the new opportunity for them, but some of people will be threatened. And mm -hmm. uh, I think that this polarization is something we need to address as, mm -hmm. as researchers, or as designers, or as, as mm -hmm. workers. Or Okay, what other, so, so you told technology, right, Mr. Rowe? Well, in my opinion, uh, second, uh, it will be the narrative from the people who are in power, mm -hmm. politics around us. Uh -huh. That will be the most important factor impacting us. Uh -huh. This is going to sound like a cliche, um, but um, the artificial intelligence in our lives is already mm -hmm. here. For those of you who play with Google Home or Siri, mm -hmm. It's doubling its capability about every year at this point. And um, that's a, that means that 10 years from now, um, our lives are going to be completely different. We're going to have essentially another person in our lives who does nothing but support us, um, which is an AI. It's like that movie, Her. I think this is mm -hmm. looking very mm -hmm. real. And that's probably going to have all kinds of scary and possibly nice implications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would uh, also say politics, actually. Politics. Like, yeah, but uh, so. Okay. Natalia. Yeah, probably politics, technology, and climate. Climate, <laughs> the yeah. What um, factors, yeah. But actually, I was um, thinking about all these values that were mentioned next to millennials group. I was trying to figure out if I identify with them or whether they are pre-financial financial crisis values. Mm -hmm. Because some of these trends that you mentioned, Eva, I think they um, stem from uh, anxiety management. Anxiety management, yes. yes. I mm -hmm. believe like, that we are, you know, like mental health is mm -hmm. like, one of the most crucial mm -hmm. factors that determines lives of uh, people, especially in, in big cities. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, things like empathy, sustainability, peer-to-peer uh, -peer shared uh, services is, mm -hmm. is, is arises from that. Mm -hmm. And um, I was really excited to hear uh, what you mentioned about these shared uh, economy lifestyles in your community because I also think, and this is already visible, let's say, like in my community, uh, sharing Netflix accounts, you know, or like hacking <laughs> Netflix <laughs> account with your friends, <laughs> like basic things like that. <laughs> Still consumer lifestyles, but. <laughs> okay. So I, I, I just have another proposal. Yeah. So without without AI, which seems obvious, we we will we can, we, we can think of consequences of development of 3D print, three D printing, nanocomputing, bioengineering, autonomous vehicles and other machines, yeah, robots, drones, remote diagnostics. These are all good candidates for these factors that will change our lives in next years, maybe decade, uh, and and will be a great turnover and. One thing for sure is that we cannot picture it uh, yet uh, in full extension. Right? Actually, it's uh, I like when I see 3D printing here first, mm -hmm. and I uh, I work um, in architecture field. Mm -hmm. I don't. Uh, uh, a lot of architects were were for many years thinking that uh, 3D printing will change architecture totally, 
And actually, I see totally different thing from the other side that uh, uh, architecture is going to the, the other direction, that mm -hmm. people want to reunion themselves, they want to make participatory architecture, this kind of stuff, instead mm -hmm. of uh, that this is just more about like uh, just technical things. And mm -hmm. I think about uh, uh, this usership things. Yeah. So it's actually going uh, much stronger. This need, I, fe I feel it's stronger than, than the other one. So I, after all our discussion, I have an impression that uh, paradoxically, and this is not only uh, an impression that I have from this debate, um, technology and its uh, intensive development causes cert certain uh, physical feedback. I mean, we, we are getting, we, we have enough of it, and we are turning ourselves toward empathy, human relations, being offline, and more can cautious and uh, aware, self-conscious use of technology, right? So, and this, this, this value turnover is something interesting, I believe. So, Alec? Wishful thinking. Wishful thinking. Also, but I also wanted to say, I think a lot of this is very aspirational. Yeah. Uh -huh. Like we are, let's say, like we would like to, and yeah. so maybe you are talking about the future, but like, mm -hmm. are we really going <laughs> offline? Like, honestly, how many times this week, and so on, right? Um, aspirations, yes, but... So yeah, fantasizing. I about this list, I'm, when you say AI, I agree, but with a lot of more detailed technologies, I often don't like uh, visions of the future that just mention a technology. I think betting on just the technology, uh, technologies it's may pass. If you mention a technology and something else, if you say that, and I don't know, um, trust or well-being, that starts to make sense. That's a, it's a vision. I think you always need to add something to a technology mm -hmm. uh, to really think about it. I, I remember one joke uh, of uh, one curator that uh, show that was watching uh, new media uh, art piece from a student and uh, the student was uh, speaking a lot about it and showing a lot and uh, the curator uh, said uh, yeah okay but when there is no electricity your art is <laughs> not existing <laughs> you know so in this <laughs> yeah Okay, so uh, I'm really sorry to, to, to finish this discussion because I have always this feeling that we are just, you know, starting over and, and uh, getting, getting more and more engaged. But there is uh, now a time for so-called announcements, so you can be all, be, you are all pleased to welcome to go into this, you know, space between, uh, beside the room. Uh, for a few minutes uh, for these announcements and then uh, a quarter past uh, seven I invite you also for a very interesting uh, meeting with very peculiar um, guest with uh, Igor Omulecki who is one of the most significant Polish visual artists and we will be talking about new uh, dimensions and uh, of photography about new photography, new idea of photography in the room back there at the end of the other part of the hall. And right now I want to thank you all for coming here, for giving uh, us your time and your thoughts, and for you uh, for taking part and staying that long without going out. Yes, so now the panel is officially over and let's meet out there for announcements, right? Thank you very much. Thank you.